not quite young man. Are you doing that, Drew, or is it just doing by itself? There you go. I just want to start with one uh, slide for our fellows in particular. I, I know in this world of genomics and proteomics and uh, cytokines and chemokines, but I wanted to remind you Dust mite control is still extremely important. It seems to be the single most important thing in our field here. I found this on the internet today. So running around chasing dust mites is probably a research project for the new fellows coming in in July. Um, the other comment I just want to make, remind you, the last session of the year is a dinner function. Uh, that's going to be on the 29th over at what I still call Patel. I forget the real name of that, but uh, that'll probably be 6.30 in the evening, and I'll send out an invitation. Um, today we're going to continue having Greg give his superb annual talk to us, teaching us about rheumatology. So today is rheumatology for the allergist. Thanks again, Greg. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak to this group. I always get my toughest questions from you guys. Not that I'm encouraging that. Or anything, but, uh, um, and Drew just came and gave us an excellent talk, uh, update us on allergy, and uh, so I know it's Zola after all, right? Uh, it's for all education. So I chose a couple of topics. One that you and I have to deal with. Uh, I couldn't find much literature from your literature uh, about how common this is. Then the second part we'll talk about uh, update and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Not that you treat rheumatoid arthritis, but. The issue is, is there something in the way we think about treating medications that you can take to your own field um, and uh, utilize? Let's see, there we go. So uh, the first patient, uh, let's start off at the top with the patient presentation. A uh, young woman with history of lupus complains of three weeks of severe left hip pain. It occurs with stand-in and walking and is better with rest. Some night pain, but no morning stiffness. So just to let you know, rheumatology, I don't let everybody know this, because it's a very simple way of thinking about patients. Uh, there are only three basic kinds of joint pain. Inflammatory, mechanical, and fibromyalgia. Right? So mechanical pain is, I'm, I'm not so bad in the morning, but the more I use the joint, the more it hurts. Inflammatory, like RA, is I, when, I, when I get up in the morning, I'm stiff, but the more active I am, the better I feel. And finally, fibromyalgia is I'm stiff in the morning, I hurt in the afternoon, and if I overdo it, I pay for it for a couple of days. That's the three basic the patterns of joint disease. This one is more of a mechanical pain. Um, and this is a, somebody with an inflammatory disease. So my thoughts are thinking a little differently in this patient. So she had uh, 10 years of lupus, a uh, history of nephritis, uh, rash, Raynaud's phenomenon, and arthritis. She was on mycophenolate, prednisone, and has had prednisone as high as 60 milligrams per day in the past. Uh, she has pain on internal rotation of the left hip, otherwise the exam is, is unremarkable. X-rays are unremarkable as well. So what am I going to do? Uh, am I going to increase her prednisone, thinking this is an inflammatory disease? Well, again, she gave us a mechanical type pattern. Am I going to add naproxen, uh, 500 milligrams uh, twice a day? Wouldn't be unreasonable, I guess. Send to physical therapy? Well, maybe. Inject the left trochanteric bursa. Well, I didn't find any of that on examination. 
What about send for an MRI scan? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah that, that's actually the correct answer in this case. Can I interrupt you just for a second? Is fibromyalgia a real disease? Well, it is. Uh, we, I think it is. Um, uh, certainly, it's a phenotype uh, of, uh, of, of probably a compilation of a bunch of things in terms of neural endocrine abnormalities, uh, deconditioning, hopelessness. Uh, sure, it's probably a true biopsychosocial process. Um, so yeah, we we do believe that it's uh, it's it's a, it's a real process, but there are, there are a lot of other things that play into it besides uh, simply or uh, bio biology. So definition of osteonecrosis, which this is, is it's a critical ischemia to osteocytes and adipocytes, leading to bone death and deformity of the bone. Um, it's also known as aseptic necrosis of bone and avascular necrosis of bone. You may have heard it that way. Here's uh, an early stage of AVN. This is stage two. It's a little mottled there. This is definitely uh, advanced stage osteonecrosis. This is an 18-year-old girl who had, who had uh, lupus nephritis as a child, got high dose steroids. Uh, and I was sort of, uh, when I, uh, we'll talk about this, but... Uh, we, we talked about osteonecrosis with our pediatric colleagues recently, and, and uh, so they say they put them on high dose steroids and get them back to recess as soon as they can. And that made me cringe. And I'll tell you why that is in a few minutes. It's a fascinating sort of uh, uh, process. And again, I, I, I know you use high dose steroids. Anybody here had not seen a case of os uh, avascular necrosis, osteonecrosis? Okay. That is an allergy. More important question: How many of us caused the case yeah. of osteoporosis? What's that? More important question: How many of us caused the case of osteoporosis? Yeah, I, I, I doubt anybody. If you've used high dose steroids, I suspect everybody here may have caused the case of osteoporosis. Uh, but I'll tell you how we might be able to prevent that, or at least think about it uh, a little more critically. It's a common process. Up to 20,000 people a year develop osteonecrosis. Uh, typically in the fourth decade, but for steroid associated ON, it's in the 30s. Everybody, uh, or most people, have an ascribed risk factor, but that's often, oh, you had steroids uh, uh, six months ago, well, it's probably a cause of your osteonecrosis. So it's not, it's not clear in how much is sort of uh, ascribed and how much is really associated. Um, the femoral head is the most common place affected by osteonecrosis. Uh, some patients actually have, and we see this in lupus patients in particular, develop multi-joint AVN, which is absolutely devastating for patients. Um, up to 40% of solid organ transplants uh, were affected at one point, but because they're now using lower-dose steroid protocols, that number has dropped precipitously, but it's not zero. So here are the known risk factors for osteonecrosis. Um, I'm trying to remember this guy's name. Uh, Landis, wasn't it? So he developed osteonecrosis from trauma. Fell off his bike, developed uh, uh, osteonecrosis. But there he may have another risk factor there, it looks like. Uh, a, little, a little too much champagne. Uh, plus, I don't know what the, uh, the uh, extra EPO did for his... Uh, his uh, so alcoholism, corticosteroids, radiation, trauma is number one, caissons disease, uh, sickle cell disease uh, in its, all its forms, Gaucher's disease, again, very common things. Um, but also possible risk factors include phospholipid antibodies, smoking, hyperlipidemia, heart therapy in patients who are, have HIV, vascularized Crohn's and SLE may be independent risk factors for uh, foster necrosis. And the question is, is can you have a little bit of several things that can develop foster necrosis? So, if you're on a certain level of steroids, if you smoke and drink uh, uh, more than socially, um, do you have an increased risk of osteoporosis? The literature isn't clear on that, but uh, uh, some, some people actually think that that may be true. Another risk factor is high doses of long-term bicycle riding to give you uh, decreased bone density because you're not weight-bearing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So how much stero how a little steroid is too much? So this is sort of a critical issue for us that we use steroids. How much does it take for a patient to be at risk for osteonecrosis? 
So the literature seems pretty clear. It's at least 20 milligrams a day for uh, at least one month. That's sort of a critical level before you develop osteoporosis. So people who get 10 milligrams a day, for our, our rheumatoid patients who are on 5 and 10 milligrams a day, almost never develop osteoporosis. You don't see that. But our lupus patients who are on 20 milligrams or more a day uh, can develop osteoporosis. Uh, the highest daily dose, and uh, to a lesser degree, cumulative dose are associated with ON. Uh, for example, there's uh, data that suggests, again, 5% develop ON at six months if they've been 20 milligrams for at least a month, uh, 21% if it's 160 milligrams a day for the first month. I've never used that much steroid orally. I've used that much IV in some of my really sick patients. The other thing that really is a key, is a clue to, to the risk of osteoporosis is this. Here's a, a, a woman who's been put on steroids. Here she is before steroids. Here she is on steroids. So the, if somebody becomes Cushionoid on our steroid therapy, that's a red flag for the possible risk of osteonecrosis. Um, if you have one side affected, you have a 55% chance of having the other side affected within the next year. So if somebody develops on one side, we've got to think about the other side as well. Um, so I've actually found a few uh, rare case reports that, uh, of people with asthma who had osteoporosis ascribed to their oral steroids. That seems a little far-fetched. You know, seem to have to lose quite a bit. But again, there's, are these COBUS factors playing a role here? If you have a statistic that's that strong, is there any treatment modality that when you pick these people up and they've been on steroids for a month, you arbitrarily put them on something protected? We'll talk about that. That's uh, that's a few more minutes. That's a nice lead-in. So with lupus, uh, up to 50% of my patients will develop osteoporosis. That's a big chunk. If you look at just MRI studies, you follow these people prospectively, irrespective of symptoms, up to 40% of SLE patients will have some areas of, of osteoporosis. Um, that, uh, that don't come to symptomatic uh, levels. And I'll tell you why that is in a few minutes. Um, again, small lesions may, uh, may actually resolve without actually coming, uh, becoming clinical. Uh, um, again, I couldn't find, this is only uh, information I could find from your literature, and it's old, about how often do people with asthma and other pulmonary diseases that you might see um, develop osteonecrosis from steroids. And the best number I could find uh, was uh, 10%. These are patients who got high-dose steroids uh, for a year or more. I don't know how often your asthma patients are on chronic steroids anymore. That probably is pretty rare these days. Um, but I know some, probably some of your uh, uh, other allergic patients probably get uh, steroids. I don't know if you're, but I, I think the levels of steroids that we tend to use have gone way down because we've got better drugs these days. So here's the pathophysiology of osteoporosis, and it's, just, it's really fascinating. This is early in my career, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this and, uh, and writing about it. So there's three elements. The one in the middle, I think, is probably the most important, but because we know the, maybe the less about the other two. But there are some vascular changes that steroids introduce. Um, you get endothelial apoptosis, you get uh, thrombus uh, uh, predisposition in those vessels. Uh, what the steroids definitely do is they cause adipogenesis and fat cell hypertrophy. So that's why your face gets fat when you're on steroids. So the same thing is happening in your face is happening in the ends of your long bones. And I'll show you some pictures of that in just a second. That leads to intraosseous pressure increase and venous hypertension uh, and decrease in arterial inflow into the, the bone. And there's actually some bone changes as well. So you do get some changes in, in osteoblast and osteoclast um, that favors um, osteoclast, so it tends to weaken the bone uh, and the repair process is impaired and patients can get in trouble. So here's, uh, this, this is from an article that Peter Simkin and I wrote uh, many years ago, but it's still sort of interesting. These are little sinusoidal vessels that appear uh, that, be, that are between the, the uh, arterial and venous side of the uh, bone circulation. Here's a close-up of that. And it's surrounded by fat and marrow cells, and uh, 
The blood flow typically is arterial to venous, as you would expect. But what happens when fat cell hypertrophy and intraosseous hypertension, here's uh, sickle cell disease actually causing intrasinusoidal clumping, um, is that these fat cells actually push on these very compliant sinusoidal vessels. Um, the pressure increases, and with, with impact loading, the actual pressure within the joint or the bone increases. And I'll show you why that is in a second. It's fascinating. Um, which actually can increase the pressure so high that some of these fat cells are actually pushed into the fenestra and pushed uh, uh, arterial word and actually can interrupt the blood supply and cause uh, uh, ischemia downstream. It's called the retrograde embolization hypothesis. Peter Sumkin came up with that based on some very nice uh, work that he's done. This is a fascinating concept of uh, form and function. Almost all AVN osteoporosis occurs on the convex portion of the joint. Joints have a concave and a convex portion. As it turns out, um, here's the, uh, uh, the, the bone thickness of the acetabulum, and here's the bone thickness of the femoral head. Look at the difference there. <clears throat> So with, uh, it has to be that way so that you don't blow this part of the joint out when you bear weight on it. This actually gives way with weight bearing in order to prevent damage to your cartilage. If you stiffen this area up uh, underneath that, uh, in animal models of osteoarthritis, uh, the, the, the dog or whatever, destroys the cartilage very quickly. So unless this is a compliant bone, you damage your cartilage. But being compliant, when we weight bear on it, we increase pressure further when we do so. And that serves the function to return it to normal uh, configuration, if you would, uh, once the pressure is released. Uh, but it does have some detrimental effects, and it also explains why osteonecrosis almost always occurs on the uh, convex side of the joint. A tibial plateau is a little bit different. Uh, the uh, meniscus serves as that concave portion of the joint. Uh, so that the knee is one of the joints where you can get uh, both sides of the joints affected by osteonecrosis. I think it's just fascinating. So here's what happens at the various stages of osteonecrosis. Uh, so you get critical bone ischemia and osteocytes and adipocytes die. And so here's the, here's the, the dead bone here. Um, you get this uh, uh, um, hyperemic zone that comes in to try to repair the whole process. Um, in doing so, because the steroids have actually Im Im impaired that ability to repair the bone, these become relatively weak. And they're called stress risers in biomechanics. Uh, if you have a large volume of infarct and you've weakened the supporting structure, um, the bone, the dead bone actually collapses into the healing phase of, uh, that's coming up to try to repair it. And then you get process of uh, advanced osteonecrosis because the cartilage now loses its support, it degenerates, and you develop osteoarthritis. It's, a, it's unfortunately too often the case in many of our patients with osteonecrosis. Here's a, a, a gross uh, anatomic uh, uh, specimen showing you this process. Here's the dead bone. Here's the repair process trying to occur on, and here's this hyperemic area of repair cells that are trying to come in uh, and replace the dead bone with, uh, with living bone. And again, there's that, <coughs> that wave that moves forward trying to heal the area. That, that month of 20 milligrams a day uh, that causes osteonecrosis that you quoted, what, where does it become irreversible? Is it a month or will that spontaneously revert if you stop at that point? Or? So, the, the, I'll tell you in a second, the critical element in terms of what happens in progression is how much bone has died. As I mentioned, a lot of lupus patients will have areas of osteonecrosis by MRI, but they never progress. It's because they're small. So, we talked about that critical number of 20 milligrams of, of prednisone. The other critical element in progression of osteonecrosis is how much bone was infarcted. Um, here's the normal staging process. Uh, uh, there's a, a variety of them out there. This is one I think is probably just fairly reasonable. Uh, this is radiographic, not MRI. So normal is uh, 
Stage one, you have the disease, but you can't see it on x-ray. Stage two is you get some mottling of the x-ray as the bone is trying to be repaired. Uh, stage three is a crescent sign where that dead bone is now collapsed in on the, uh, on the, on the repair process. Stage four is further uh, uh, flattening of the joint. Stage five is osteoarthritis. And stage six is like that young girl I showed you earlier on with advanced osteonecrosis. And you can modify each one of these stages based on an MRI determination, a volumetric determination of the size of the infarct. So a type A lesion is typically uh, less than one-third of the medial weight-bearing portion of the joint. Um, type B is less than two-thirds. And type C is greater than two-thirds of the weight-bearing portion of the femoral head is affected which one do you think to be the most important for progression? Type C. Type Cs are the ones we worry about the most. And why more bone is infarcted in one patient and not another is really not clear. Probably a multifactor. <coughs> so that is the key element in terms of, of prognosis, is how much bone is infarcted and where is it infarcted. Does this happen in children where the bones are still growing? Yes, it does. So they can still have osteoporosis. You know, I've never heard it in kids, um, little kids. I don't think they have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, fat in the, uh, in the marrow bones. I think uh, that typically happens in adolescents and adults, where you get some of that marrow that's replaced by fat. Now, fat does serve a purpose as, again, a cushion with, uh, with weight bearing. But I, I think I've never seen a case in a child. I've only seen a case in adolescents. So that's an excellent question. So here's that stage two I told you about. I don't have a stage one. Stage one is just normal. There's that mottling of the bone. This looks a little, a little thicker than it should. Here's that early stage three crescent sign where the dead bone is now trying, is, uh, is trying to collapse in on itself. Here's a little bit more advanced stage, uh, let's say stage four, where the collapse has actually occurred and the bone has become flat. And here's that stage six, um, advanced osteoporosis. Again, this is an 18-year-old girl who had had hip pain for probably four or five years. And uh, again, MRI really is the key. Here's a patient with osteoporosis, and the MRI scan shows you these areas of marrow edema. It's called a double line sign, uh, where the uh, where the marrow is edematous, and it it's, uh, shows you area of, of uh, osteocyte bone marrow death. And then here it is for this knee down here. Quite extensive in this case. The next patient was a patient who had received heart therapy. Uh, and this was, was their... Um, the one good thing is for this patient is that I remember a lot of the infarct was not in the weight-bearing portion of the joint. I recently saw, I saw a young woman with uh, idiopathic osteoporosis of her knee. And one of the critical elements was we got an MRI scan, it hadn't been done yet. And what I wanted to know is where were the infarcts? Where were the infarcts? The infarcts actually were up the shaft and not in the weight bearing portion of the bone, which means her prognosis is quite good. Here's a variety of other forms of osteonecrosis, key box disease, uh, which is in the wrist. I've seen occasional cases of spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee in, in older patients. It's so usually medial femoral condyle. Osteochondritis desiccans can occur around places like the, uh, not only the knee, but also the uh, ankle, tailored dome. Uh, Lane Covey's purse disease is in uh, adolescence uh, in the hip. I've seen this occasionally, transient regional osteoporosis. It doesn't quite come to osteonecrosis, but can cause a lot of pain and uh, discomfort in uh, various joints. It occurs in both men and women. All right, what are the symptoms of osteonecrosis? Well, again, it's a mechanical form of joint pain. Uh, it hurts when you wait when you wait bear on it. But it also of interest. This is a, this is a, something you might take away is is if a patient complains to you of night pain, my hip hurts at night or my knee hurts at night. That's a that's a suggestion that the patient may be developing interosseous hypertension, and may be at risk for osteonecrosis. That's a key sign from a patient who's been on who is on or has been on steroids. Uh, pain in the hip is typically in the groin. Uh, patients can often remember the day or the week the symptoms began when that uh, 
hypertension became to a point where they feel it. And examination is typically unimpressive unless there's a sympathetic effusion there uh, in somebody who actually has a uh, osteoporosis. So prognosis. Um, what happens to patients? Again, I want to reiterate that, that the key element really is the size of the lesion. So this was uh, JBJS's uh, orthopedic journal uh, published in 2010. Where they looked at patients who had osteoporosis, what happened to the other side? Um, as it turns out, uh, uh, they have 664 asymptomatic femoral head osteoporosis lesions, patients who had bad disease on the other side. Uh, and the key element or the key point is that the, the prognosis was directly tied to the size of the lesion. Look at the uh, progression to collapse based on that, that MRI size uh, parameter. 59% of type C versus 9% of type A. It also depend on what kind of disease you have. So sickle cell patients uh, had much more progression, probably had larger areas of necrosis. Uh, ethanol pa using patients also tend to get uh, hyperlipidemia and also um, uh, fat uh, hypertrophy in the, in the distal long bones. Renal transplant patients, again, that number is going down. Lupus patients, that number stayed pretty stable. About 17% uh, will collapse. This is data that uh, I published uh, with uh, one of our fellows and Peter Simpkin years ago. And it's one of those things, you don't need a statistician to tell you that there's something is different, right? So uh, these are all patients, uh, 31 patients who had undergone uh, core decompression for their osteonecrosis of their femoral head, which is a classic you know, historical way of trying to treat this. But at the time, nobody was using MRI to stage these patients. So, but look at this. So, if we found that if you had more than about 21% of your femoral head involved by volume, again, going back to the size uh, quote, uh, issue, you invariably did well. Uh, here's one who had more who didn't do poorly. If you had more than 21%, you invariably did poorly, in spite of having poor decompression. Um, and again, uh, this is a more recent, uh, this is actually, oh, this is, uh, the, this is the guy who thought about size of MRI lesions, and again, progression based on size. And down here, type A, B, and C lesions, you can see the percent of uh, numbers that progressed uh, in, in his patients as well. Um, this is a group of patients, uh, the only people who got osteonecrosis were those who received 30 to 60 milligrams per day. Uh, the, the dose range actually was 10 to 100 milligrams in these patients, all SLE patients. Again, reiterated the fact you need more than a certain amount of steroid in order to get osteoporosis. So 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, 20 milligrams for a very short period of time, probably even 60 for a week or two is probably not going to do it. It really takes time for you to develop that uh, fat hypertrophy uh, and adipogenesis. Um, but again, I want to reiterate that there may be some other factors that may play a role. One of the things why this is important is that uh, at least a few years ago, uh, plaintiff attorneys had uh, figured out osteoporosis was a lucrative uh, uh, way to make some extra money. So let's talk about prevention. How, do you, how might you prevent osteoporosis as you start somebody on high-dose steroids? Well, think about co-risk factors. Again, there's no hard, fast data. But I think it makes sense until we have more information that we try to get our patients to not use a lot of alcohol or their smoking, try to get them to, it's hard to stop, right? At least cut down and, and warn them of the risks of the, the co-occurrence of those two things. Of course, use the lowest steroid dose and for the shortest period of time. They've been able to do this in, uh, in uh, renal transplant patients, and their rates of osteoporosis have, have plummeted uh, in the last few years. The other important thing is, we've talked about the, the important role that impact loading has in terms of increasing interosseous pressure, at least transiently. So we have all our patients do not do any impact loading activities. Stay in good shape, do some stretching, some swimming maybe, some low impact bicycling, uh, but don't do any racket sports, don't do any running, uh, don't do anything that might potentially increase that interosseous pressure. Um, do calcium channel blockers reduce interosseous hypertension? There is some, just some anecdotal experience that using things like um, deltiazem 
or nifedipine or amlodipine may decrease interosseous pressure. How it does it is not quite clear. I had a young woman recently who I mentioned already who I put on deltiazem. She was having some night pain and it dramatically improved her discomfort uh, by doing so. What about statins? That's an interesting uh, possibility. There's not a lot of data on it. There is tons of data in animal models. Now, animals tend to get very hyperlipemic and uh, cushionoid, if you would, when they get steroids, much more so than humans do. So there is a, there's a lot of literature where animal models are looked at in which statins are definitely important in terms of preventing osteonecrosis. There's only two studies in humans, one published in 2001, which these are both retrospective. And uh, the first one was done by one of our orthopedists here in Seattle, James Prickett, uh, or Pritchett. Uh, we looked retrospectively at 284 patients who were on statins before they started their steroids and continue on the statins the whole time they were on their steroids. And uh, he documented all, and actually followed patients up with MRI scan, although it wasn't clear from the paper how many people got uh, MRI scans. Did you have to have symptoms to get an MRI scan, or did everybody get an MRI scan? I think it was probably more symptomatic MRIs. But he developed, he, he reported only a 1% development of osteoporosis uh, average follow up of 7.5 years, which is pretty darn low. Yeah, there's no control group here. This is simply observational retrospective data. Uh, a more recent study that was uh, actually a uh, controlled trial, they looked at uh, renal transplant patients on or not on statins. Now, you could be on a statin up to 31 days after you started your, um, your steroids, and that was considered being on a statin. So uh, maybe a little too late at 31 days, potentially. Anyway, he found that there was a uh, 4.4% uh, uh, osteonecrosis rate if you were on a statin to 7% if you were not, which was not clinically significant. Um, but I think the, the, it still begs the question, do statins help? And I think uh, some better studies might actually answer the question. Again, patients who are on statins before they start the steroids, I think it's a critical issue. Uh, and also on statins the whole time, they're on the steroids. Do you start your patients on statins? I don't. Uh, so what I typically do, what Greg does, is, again, try to minimize the use of steroids, um, talk about co-risk factors, they're on a statin, great. Um, and um, again, if they're, and I try to use uh, steroid spraying agents as quickly as I can. Somebody with, say, uh, polymyositis, they get steroids and methotrexate the first visit. And then I try to minimize uh, their exposure to steroids. It turns out also IV steroids are safer than daily PO. If you think about the steroid IV, if you get them a bolus of steroids, they, they get exposed to the steroid, it's gone. So there's not that chronic stimulation to out of, out of the, the genesis that occurs with daily oral steroids. But I'm, uh, I, I'm thinking I, I need to do, I, the, uh, the transplant group has, has a nice database called MAX. So I'm thinking if I get one of the fellows interested, we could look at our transplant population and ask the question of statins or no statins. But I think it's really an, an important issue. What about uh, people with established osteonecrosis? Well, as it turns out, there may be some therapy for them. It's bisphosphonates, which have in themselves been associated with osteoporosis of the jaw. Uh, but there's a couple studies that actually look quite interesting for preventing collapse in patients with osteonecrosis. And some of our surrey patients are on prophylactic uh, bisphosphonates to prevent uh, osteoporosis from the steroids. Uh, whether that has any uh, prophylactic effect, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So this is where they looked at patients with advanced stages of osteo stage two or three, and type C lesions. So those big lesions, um, and they followed them uh, 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 24 weeks after uh, after initiating uh, the study, uh, and had uh, 10 weeks of X-rays. So there were 20 patients and 29 hips. Uh, there weren't that many with steroid osteoporosis. And the control group was 20 patients with 25 hips. And they wanted to know, uh, the endpoint was development of stage four or five. So essentially, um, collapse and osteoarthritis. And here was the uh, uh, intervention. So two of 29 of the intervention hips progressed to collapse, one requiring surgery. 19 of 25 control hips collapsed, 16 requiring surgery. Again, that's one of those studies, you don't need a statistician to tell you that those two things are different. 
Uh, so the conclusion was uh, linternate 70 milligrams per week influenced the natural history of osteoporosis of the hip. And I do use this for some of my patients who develop OM. Here it is in graphical form. So uh, blue is bad, green is good, uh, and you can see the difference there between those two. If you look at the osteonecrosis of the jaw that's associated with the bisphosphonates pathologically, is it the same disease as what you see in the hips? You know, I don't know that. That's a great question. And I'll have to go back and look. I think it's probably different. I don't know what the pathophysiology is of that. It typically occurs in people who get these really high doses of, of, uh, of bisphosphonates, typically for, for cancer, uh, who also have poor dentition and uh, who often have recent jaw procedure done. So I don't. I suspect it's probably a little bit different, but I don't know that. That's a great question. Whether it's true ON or not, I don't know. Um, here's another study. It occurs at the mandible side, though. What's that? It occurs like in the right grinding part of your mandible, at the but mechanical. It, it's uh, yeah, typically in sort of the back end of the jaw. I don't know how what kind of pressures are applied there. Uh, Pressure related in the jaw. What's that? Pressure related in the jaw. I, no, nobody knows that for sure. It tends to be again high dose uh, and dental procedure. It has to, maybe it has to do with blood flow to some degree. I, I just don't know. That's a great question. I'll have to look into that. Um, another another study where they did the same thing: more steroids uh, uh, treated patients. And here's a graphical demonstration of that, which again is very impressive. Look at the, uh, here's the, uh, the control group. Here's the, the C lesions. They divided them into C1 and C2 based on where they're positioned to some degree. Look at the C lesions over here, only one progressed. And look at the C lesions here. Again, suggesting that uh, bisphosphonates may have a dramatic impact on natural history. Well, the, the first group that I, I showed you actually did a more controlled trial uh, uh, and looked uh, prospectively, not just retrospectively, at some extent. Um, and they looked at for a longer period of time. And uh, at two years, they couldn't find much difference between the, uh, the groups. But their outcomes was surgery, and it wasn't necessarily collapsed. So I'm going to go back and look at this paper in a little more detail. Uh, they didn't think there was much difference, but uh, again, the outcome may be a little bit different. And we're interested in, in collapse um, and uh, not necessarily just surgery. Finally, surgical treatments, uh, core decompression does relieve pain, but it doesn't seem to affect natural history. Uh, some of our colleagues in orthopedics have actually uh, gone to using what are called vascularized fibular grafts. You take part of your fibula with a blood supply uh, tied into around your hip, and uh, now they shove it up into a core decompression uh, shaft, and, uh, and I guess that does tend to support that dead bone until your body can, can heal it. The problem with this literature is it's really based on radiographic, not MRI staging. So it's been somewhat hard to, for me to understand in terms of outcomes. Um, and then there's always a total joint arthroplasty that can occur. It's the, the failure rates for such patients are said to be quite high. And again, because ON occurs in such young patients who are otherwise pretty active, you can imagine what happens when you put an a artificial hip or artificial knee in some of those patients. We're used to being very active, not our typical 60 or 70 or 80 year old person who content to, to go out to dinner and, and do some traveling, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some hiking. Uh, but not certainly the things that a 30 or 30 year old person are, are trying to do. And so they have a high failure rate. You know? So if we, anything we can do to prevent it from happening, and if it does occur, prevent it from collapsing is, uh, is, is gonna be very useful. Um, so, just by way of uh, summary, uh, it's a problem for all those of us who use high-dose steroids. It doesn't get a lot of press because it's not as dramatic as some of the infections that we see with high-dose steroids or some of the complications. But the morbidity can be quite uh, significant and it does really change the quality of people's lives. If somebody is cushionoid, really worry. Um, again, talk about short uses of steroids if we can, limit cofactors, consider statins. You have reason to put them on statin. You know, I think it would be reasonable based on the animal models. Uh, again, I can't confirm that with animals or human studies to date. Remember, the MRI gives us prognostic information, 
And finally, uh, bisphosphonate can be considered once it's established to prevent aggression. Yes. Every other day, therapy with steroids make a difference. Um, it tends to make you a little less cushionoid, so I'm assuming it might uh, might be useful. But I don't again, I don't have that data. It's just simply uh, a guesstimation. Can anybody look at vitamin D? <coughs> no, so vitamin D has not been looked up. I'm aware of. That's a good question. In animal models, can stem cell um, reverse it? Have they worked on you know generating? Um, I'm not aware it's been looked at though in terms of stem cells. <coughs> John Clark, when he was here at the university, uh, actually uh, thought about doing, uh, he would pack the area below the cartilage that had collapsed with, uh, with bone material, and, it, and again, attempts to, quite the stem cell, but attempts to try to uh, support the cartilage until the bone can be repaired. Uh, but stem cell, I'm going to put Any other questions about Owen before we move on to some rheumatoid arthritis? How about the uh, family practitioners to give the Depo Medrol shot for the allergy season? You'll hear from people. Does that ever happen? Just one high dose uh, Depo? You know, I'm sure it's been reported. In fact, I've seen it been reported before. You give somebody high dose uh, Depo Medrol, um, and it tends to self taper over about three weeks. Now, I have seen, I was involved, I was involved in a legal case where somebody kept coming into an urgent care with their, I think they had urticaria. And kept getting depomedral shots like once a month. Oh. And that patient developed osteoporosis, and then, of course, the uh, legal profession got involved uh, for that. Just a question. This is essentially the same question. The effective catalog given by EMTs and PCs the same question. Yeah, again, I think uh, again, if it's a repeated process, uh, it may be an issue. But if it's a one time thing, it's probably the risk is extremely low. Stan, uh, Stan, uh, who's Stan? Uh, Stan Herring. Uh, there was a guy here from orthopedics, and one time he said uh, he was concerned about uh, having practitioners giving patients uh, medrol dose packs for their, for their back pain um, and uh, what, what impact that might have on, on osteoporosis. He said he'd seen numerous cases of that. I, I had, it actually had been published, but it was a sort of uh, off the cuff thing during a conference. There's a lot of data on steroid dosing. I think you ask 10 different doctors, you get 10 different right answers. They think are the right answer for steroid dosing. What does the data say? You know, there is no good data. Why do we use a gram of solimedrol in our lupus patients with lupus nephritis? Why not 500 to 250? That's what I was taught. You know, sort of uh, what you're taught. How, why is my, my uh, ophthalmology colleagues use 80 to 100 milligrams uh, for somebody with uh, giant solivaritis? I use 40 to 60. Why do they do that? Why, you know, what, how much more anti-inflammatory effect do you get from 80 than you get from 60 or from 40? There's just, it's all sort of experiential and what your, what your mentor used, that's what you tend to use as well. So there's really no good data. And I don't that's, think uh, we in our field, hopefully, we don't use enough long enough that would be my personal impression that we're not seeing this. As you've been talking, I can think of one patient I need to go back who I inherited with terrible cushionoid disease from the way his asthma was being treated, but otherwise it's, it's very rare for us. That's, uh, that's good. You're probably dosing steroids uh, judiciously. Um, let's go on and talk about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, give you an update on how that's treated in the last uh, 20 minutes. So there's a 56-year-old artist comes for six months of pain and swelling in multiple joints, including the hands, elbows, knees, and feet. Takes two hours to get uh, going, but is stiff all day. Exercises, goes to spas, aspirin helps. Moved to southern France to get out of the cold weather. He's got swelling of multiple PIPs, MCPs, right elbow, both knees, and multiple MTPs. His CDI score, uh, why do I mention bring this up? CDI is Clinical Disease Activity Index. We've gone to actually trying to quantitate patients' disease activity in order to try to treat the target. Our target is low disease activity or remission. I don't know, do you have similar scores for some of the diseases you see? Do you actually try to quantitate uh, levels of disease and then treat to a certain response? Is that something that you do currently in any of your diseases? Able to quantitate disease burden, if you would? Kind of like an ACT score for asthma, where we try and quantify symptoms. And I'll, also, as one as I was on my way over here, if somebody has asthma early, is there any changes that occur to the airways if it's not treated properly? 
are there quite changes to airways that occur down the road that are irreversible uh, if treatment is not uh, not done early? The process is called remodeling, yes. where parts of the basement lamina thicken and you get some smooth muscle hypertrophy. And is that irreversible? But we don't know. Uh, probably yes. We don't think any drug we have reverses it. Steroids don't seem to reverse it. So we've had that same sort of argument in rheumatology for years, and we now know that by treating people early, we make a huge impact on their future outcomes. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, so his total score is 51, which is high disease activity. So rheumatoid arthritis, you remember, is an inflammatory polyarthritis. Uh, women get it more than men, like a lot of autoimmune diseases. Uh, people are typically stiff for often hours at a time. It gets better with activity because it's an inflammatory disease. Sedrate CRP are often elevated, but not invariable. Rheumatoid factors, CCP, are, are markers of uh, the presence of disease. And it likes uh, certain joints, the wrists, MCPs, the PIPs, and for some darn reason, it does not affect the DIPs. It does not affect the DIPs. So something different about the cartilage of the DIPs that for some reason rheumatoid disease doesn't attack. And they're, they're, it's staring us right in the face, something about the disease that's very important that nobody's quite figured out yet. Here's that artist. I think I showed you these maybe many years ago when they came. Um, here's Renoir, this is Pierre Gus Renoir, uh, about, uh, he's about my age, late 50s. Um, developed, started developing joint pain around uh, 1892. Here he is in 1901, look at him here. Look at his atrophy of his, uh, of his hand muscles. He's got swelling of his MCPs. Look how skinny his leg is. What do you think that is? It's probably like he's got contractures at his knees and he can't fully exercise his uh, quadriceps, so he's, they've become atrophied. He's in southern France, but he's wearing this, this hat, this big coat. He's always cold. I, I think he's probably had thyroid disease as well, because he's always bundled up. One autoimmune disease deserves another, right? Here he is in 1903. Look how quickly he's progressed. Look how cachectic he looks, too. Probably has way too much TNF in his system. Remember, TNF used to be called cachectin. Um, you know that TNF is a critical cytokine for the development of uh, rheumatoid disease. And here he is in 1911, fully wheelchair-bound. Uh, he used these little strips of uh, cloth to protect his hands from the wheelchair. Uh, here's his favorite model uh, of the time named Didi. Here she is in the picture back here, and she later became his daughter-in-law. Married Jean Renoir, the famous uh, French um, uh, director. That's the natural history of rheumatoid arthritis. We don't treat it. That happens in way too many patients. Uh, we now have some new criteria which really focus on early identification of patients. The old criteria were very specific. So we made sure everybody who we thought had rheumatoid disease had rheumatoid disease. Now we're less interested in that. We want to know everybody who might have rheumatoid arthritis and treat them early because we know that early therapy makes a huge difference in the long-term outcome of the, uh, the patient. So what's also fascinating, again, I may have told you this before, um, that there's a long period of benign autoimmunity that occurs in rheumatoid arthritis. Patients have these antibodies, especially the CCP, anti citronated peptides, up to 14 years before they develop their clinical arthritis. It's almost like there's two hits. You develop the autoimmunity, and then something allows them to gain access to the joint, attack the antigens within the joint, and then you get the arthritis. Once the arthritis, acute arthritis develops, then there's also a progression that happens in rheumatoid disease as well. The immunology changes, and Th17 cells uh, become much more important uh, to the chronic uh, arthritis patient, uh, where you form PANIS, which is thousands and thousands of uh, synovial sites uh, that develop these joints almost a tumorous development of synovial sites, but you're, uh, then you get your joint destruction and, and damage. And once bone and cartilage is damaged, we don't get that back. Um, so the goal really is to try to prevent those changes, and if we could intervene at the time that there's benign autoimmunity, we actually may blunt the development of rheumatoid arthritis. Yes, ma'am? Are, are those antibodies actually felt to be pathogenic or any way, or more yes. a marker? Yeah, no, they're felt to be pathogenic. 
About JRA, it seems like that whole course is condensed into six months instead of 20 years. Is there same same progression? You know, JIA is now called. It's a different sort of a beast. Um, the people who get this kind of rheumatoid disease are typically adolescent girls. So JIA, what we classify as JIA is, is a multitude of things. There's systemic JIA, which is adult, was like adult stills disease. There's posse articular JIA, which is more like a spondyloarthropathy. Uh, so they lump JIA into a bunch of different things. But the, the RA that we tend to think about tends to happen in adolescent girls. So they probably have a more prolonged period of time. Have you seen more RA? It's basically said that both allergic and autoimmune diseases are both on the increase. And in our field, there are all hypotheses as to why. What, what do you say in rheumatology about that? Well, let me tell you an interesting story if I've got, I only got five more minutes. I may not have too much time. I may have told you this before, but uh, what's fascinating about rheumatoid arthritis is there were, um, there were very few reports of rheumatoid disease in Europe prior to the exploration of the Americas. Just weren't. But there's great evidence uh, of pre-Columbian rheumatoid arthritis in Native American burial sites. So they clearly had, but then once the Europeans went back with whatever they took, there was an explosion of rheumatoid arthritis in Europe. Uh, so they clearly there were the genes there, but there was some environmental factor that may have uh, caused them. And one of the um, uh, possible causes is tobacco use. Because uh, you know that smoking uh, and also the industrialization of Europe potentially, uh, you know, causes actually smokers can develop these ACPA, these actually protein uh, uh, antibodies, just from smoking itself. Um, and smoking is definitely a risk factor for rheumatoid disease. And if you smoke and have a double dose of the gene, your risk of rheumatoid disease is sky high. So one theory is why it went down for a while is that smoking became sort of unpopular. And it still is to some degree, although smoking has become a little more popular so that, that there's an uptick in the development of rheumatoid arthritis over the last few years. It actually gone way down. Now it's coming back up a little bit. Does any of the infection data band out or are you mycoplasma is it still in the picture? You know, they kept, they kept looking for mycoplasma for years and years and years and it hasn't really gone down. Now the question is, is, is that the second hit? So if you get an infection, a viral infection, and open up the joint to, to access to these antibodies, then do you get the disease. So again, a two-hit by the hypothesis is sort of uh, current fine. Yeah, I think I showed this picture before, too. Here I am in 1989, which was a critical year, not because I came out of fellowship, but because a lot of things were happening around that time in terms of our thinking. So. We all know that, well, we know in rheumatology that patients with RA tend to get erosions early. Uh, people become disabled frequently. It rarely goes into remission. And that, uh, uh, that it causes an increase in earlier, uh, uh, well, it, it decreases your life expectancy if you have rheumatoid arthritis, especially if you're old. And the main reason for early death in RA is? Cardiac. Yeah, little fashion heart disease. Now, the chronic inflammatory diseases, I don't know if that's true of asthma and some of the other things you've seen. Has anybody looked at that in asthma in terms of causes? Uh, do people with asthma die early from cardiac disease? We now know that for psoriasis, it's the same thing. People with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis die early of heart disease. So not only do I want to treat my patients to protect their joints, I want to treat them to help them live longer. So Irv Kirshner said, what we need in an RA is a drug for which one does not need a statistician to see the beneficial benefits. We now have those. Uh, here's this, uh, the C I talked about. Again, it's a, we're used to thinking about, an internist are used to thinking about uh, treating the target. And so we've uh, adopted that same sort of philosophy. Treat the target, treat early, treat aggressively, uh, prevent long-term downstream problems with uh, the disease. So here's our current treat the target uh, philosophy in rheumatoid disease. Um, we treat this for our primary care providers as well because it's so hard to get into rheumatologists, we need to have them help us out. Um, so we choose the medication based on the level of disease, the presence or absence of uh, prognostic factors, and uh, what all our primary care providers know about methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, because they can start those and uh, have them going 
uh, while they wait to see us. Some of the extra-articular, uh, more widespread features we worry about would be nodules, eye disease, uh, etc. And then there's a treatment paradigm that you don't have to worry about in terms of, again, we want to get our primary care providers uh, starting early on these patients so that we can uh, intervene later if needed. Uh, there are, let me just show you this slide. We're almost out of time. This is the current armamentarium for rheumatoid disease. When I was a fellow, there were like four or five. We've got all kinds of stuff now that are available. Um, we've got five different TNF agents. We've got anti-B cell therapy, anti-T cell therapy, anti-IL-6 therapy. We now have a JAK inhibitor. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the JAK is important for a lot of cytokine signaling um, and the JAK stat pathway, and so we now have an inhibitor for that. And there are all kinds of new agents on the way. Um, it makes me envious of our field when we buy. They've got Zola. <laughs> Do you use some of those in combination, or is there some so theoretical? We, we love using methotrexate with all these things. And there's clear evidence that the combination of methotrexate plus, say, a TNF inhibitor is better than either one by themselves. Um, let, me, uh, let me just show you just one, one interesting thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. We recently realized there's also uh, a disconnect between inflammation and bone and joint damage. So why is that? Uh, let me just show you this data, which I thought was fascinating. So this is from a study where they looked at methotrexate, the Tanner set, which is a TNF inhibitor, or a combination, and looked at their progression of their radiographs by their CRP. What was realized in some early studies is that in spite of having active inflammation on the combination therapy, your joints didn't progress. Um, and uh, so this has kind of been known recently as this, this, kind of this issue of a disconnect. You could still have inflammation, but we could protect your joints. And this also I was really, when I saw this, I went, wow. So what this is, is uh, this is a combination of methotrexate and alumumab, which is also a TNF inhibitor, uh, Humira, or methotrexate alone. And this ACR score is less than 20% improvement or 100% improvement, essentially remission. Clinical remission is based on your examination history. So. People on the combination had the same radiographic progression if he had no benefit clinically in terms of joint swelling that those on methotrexate alone had with the absolute best clinical uh, outcome. So why is that? Isn't that fascinating? Uh, certainly, I have somebody on the combination, I sleep better at night, knowing that their joints aren't progressed, even though they may still have some inflammation. Um, but uh, this is a busy slide that shows the very complex interaction between a variety of factors in the bone. So we know that uh, that rank is uh, rank ligand are very important uh, to uh, osteoclast activation activity. Uh, Went, you may have heard of Went uh, pathway. So the, the, it's a pathway that affects bone and cartilage development. Went tends to, to inhibit that. Uh, whereas WEN tends to upregulate the uh, osteoblast activity, which is good if you want to heal bone, although you need the combination of both to go back and forth. There also are various factors that influence um, um, chondrogenesis and cartilage protection. Uh, but uh, the critical thing is that TNF, uh, in particular, and some of the other cytokines, are critical for upregulating the factors that tend to uh, destroy bone. So by inhibiting TNF in this downstream cytokines like IL-6, you can have a profound effect on progression of disease. Um, I think I'll stop there. So again, uh, we've had this, I've been a rheumatologist for 25 years now, and I've seen this absolute dramatic impact on, um, on how rheumatoid arthritis uh, outcomes have, uh, are occurring. When I was a fellow, rheumatoid arthritis was typically, you know, um, wheelchairs, crutches, surgery, uh, felty syndrome, vasculitis, C1, C2 subluxation, um, rheumat uh, rheumatoid lung disease, which we still see. Now it's, it's this. Let's go on a cruise. Let's go to uh, 
uh, down to Argentina and uh, look at the end of the world and um, all kinds of really cool things. The same has been true for JIA. When I was uh, first joined the faculty 25 years ago, we'd get all these JIA uh, kids, these, you know, these women, young women, 19, 20 years old, in powered wheelchairs, pushinoids, destroyed joints. Now I see the same young women having fibromyalgia because uh, they've been on their combination therapy and they're going to school and working two jobs and overdoing it. I mean, there's just been a profound change in the outcomes for rheumatoid disease. We've still got a lot of other diseases that we've tried to make an impact on, but rheumatoid disease is one of those things where we've really made a huge impact. I mean, looking at all the drugs you have, is there any way you can predict which one of those is going to work? Because you sort of have every modality that it's known, you sort of have a drug to block each one of them. You're exactly right. And so what we really need is... Uh, a better way of saying you are an IL-6 predominant patient or you are a TNF predominant patient. Um, and gen genomics and proteomics are coming and they may help guide our therapy in the future, but right now it's uh, sort of, uh, you're not quite sure. And is there still any treatments where they inject plasma into the joints or platelet rich? Is that still going on at all? No, we don't do that. You know who does that is sports medicine people. They do it for usually soft tissue rheumatism. I know Kim Harmon in sports medicine. And, uh, Ashwin Rao, actually doing some studies where they're doing that around uh, tendinopathies in particular. So they're interested in platelet-rich platelet -rich plasma and how it may affect uh, the healing of, uh, of tendons, etc. So yeah, we don't do that in rheumatology. Into the mechanical tendinopathies or? Yeah, more mechanical. Sports kind of things. Stupid question, but more or less all the diseases you see are autoimmune inflammatory diseases. Why don't the anti-TNFs work in all of them? You know, that's a great question. It probably, and let me just tell you a quick story. So IL-1 inhibitor, Anakinder, was developed in, with rheumatoid arthritis in mind. It actually probably does decrease the uh, progression of the disease uh, from a bone to carotid, but it doesn't make people feel better, uh, which is really amazing because IL-1 is such an important cytokine for inflammation. So it, even though it's approved for RA, we never use it for RA because it just doesn't seem to make people feel better. On the other hand, um, Stills disease, Donald Sunset Stills disease, which is uh, sort of like RA in terms of its distribution of joint disease, that thing works like gangbusters. Uh, you know, Stills disease is an auto-inflammatory disease uh, where there's you know, marked reduction of IL-1. Um, as it turns out, anti-IL-17 anti drugs thought they would be the great drug for rheumatoid disease, but in early studies it was sort of like, eh, but for the spondyloarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis and Crohn's disease, it may work great. So, you know, knowing a lot about the cytokines uh, or assuming cytokines are important um, sometimes tells us, makes us realize we don't know as much about the diseases as we think. For example, TNF agents were first used in heart failure. Well, actually first for sepsis. Didn't work there. It was then used in heart failure because TNF agents are very high in people with heart failure. Didn't work there. So somebody finally said, hey, how about rheumatoid arthritis? And it worked great. So as soon as you can't predict based on what you think is the pathophysiology of disease, whether well, that's what agent's going to work or not. It's, uh, sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error until we get more uh, better at so it's pro proteomics and genomics in terms of figuring out what genes are turned on and which ones aren't. Have they ever experimented with radiation therapy, like with hands, and see if you can use x-ray therapy to shut off RA? Well, good question. RA, I'm not familiar with. It may have been years ago they did that, but they used to irradiate spines in people with ankylosing spondylitis. And it worked great until you develop your lymphoma yeah. <laughs> uh, or your leukemia. Um, I've used radiation therapy uh, rarely. I had one patient who had, before he had some of these good drugs, who had recalcitrant Kelly's and somebody with reactive arthritis, or what's called Reiter's syndrome. And I could not control his, uh, so I have sent him for radiation therapy, and it worked great. Not a really marrow-producing area, so I felt comfortable doing that. Uh, radiation therapy has been used, but it's pretty much shied away from now for, even though it works for reasons that I've just discussed. Well, thanks again. Yeah.